Imagine a city known for its music and southern hospitality suddenly gripped by fear. Nashville, Tennessee, the heart of country music, was plunged into terror in the early months of 1997. A shadow lurked in the most unexpected places restaurants where workers were just beginning their day or closing up after a long shift. Little did they know that the man walking through their doors was not just a customer. He was a predator, cold and calculated, with a thirst for more than just money. His targets were not just the cash registers, he was hunting the lives of those behind the counter. This killer, striking at random, shattered the peace of Nashville's everyday life. A series of brutal murders began to unfold across the city's restaurants, leaving the community horrified and police baffled. Employees, young and old, fell victim to a man who would leave no witnesses. These weren't just simple robberies, they were execution-style killings, marked by cold precision. The city held its breath, wondering where and when he would strike next, as the terror of the unknown killer tightened its grip on Nashville. The streets that once echoed with the sounds of music now carried whispers of fear as the community wondered who this ruthless predator was and how long it would take for justice to be served. It was an ordinary Sunday morning at Captain D's seafood restaurant on February 16, 1997. For most people, it was just another day, but by noon, the unimaginable horror that lay behind the locked doors of the restaurant would shake Nashville to its core. The district manager, concerned when the restaurant had not opened on time, arrived at the scene. Upon entering, he was faced with a nightmare, the lifeless bodies of Steve Hampton, a 25-year-old manager, and Sarah Jackson, a 16-year-old high school junior, were discovered in the back of the restaurant. Both had been executed, shot multiple times in the head, their bodies cold and still. The crime scene was chillingly clean. There was no sign of a struggle, no overturned chairs, no broken glass, no chaos that might indicate a desperate fight for survival. The tables were neatly arranged, as if awaiting the morning's first customers. The only indicators of violence were the lifeless victims and the cold precision with which their lives had been taken. Twelve shots had been fired in total, with Steve and Sarah receiving their fatal wounds in a manner so cold and calculated that police immediately recognized the hallmarks of a professional killer. The restaurant's safe and cash register had been emptied, pointing to robbery as a motive, but the execution-style killings suggested something far more sinister. It wasn't about the money, it was about eliminating witnesses, ensuring no one lived to tell the story. For the investigators on the scene, the clean, meticulous nature of the crime hinted that this was not the killer's first strike. This was a killer who knew how to cover his tracks, leaving behind almost nothing but questions and terror. Nashville, still waking up from its Sunday slumber, had no idea of the monster lurking in its midst. As the horror of the murders at Captain D's seafood restaurant set in, the investigation fell into the capable hands of Detective Pat Postiglione, a seasoned investigator with the Nashville Metro Police Department, known for his meticulous attention to detail. Postiglione, who had spent years on some of the city's most disturbing cases, knew immediately that this crime was different. This was no ordinary robbery gone wrong, it bore the hallmarks of something much darker. Joining Postiglione were a team of skilled detectives and forensic experts, each tasked with piecing together the few scraps of evidence left behind. What was striking to them from the outset was the eerie cleanliness of the crime scene. Everything appeared in order tables set, floors swept except for the bodies of Steve Hampton and Sarah Jackson. The killer had taken his time, ensuring that there was nothing left to suggest a fight or panic. This was the first clue that they were dealing with a professional, someone who had done this before, and likely would again. 
As forensic teams swept the restaurant, they found very little to work with. There were no obvious fingerprints, no signs of forced entry, and no CCTV footage to provide a lead. The killer had left almost nothing behind, a clear indication that he was calculated, methodical, and highly experienced. For Postiglione and his team, this lack of evidence was both chilling and frustrating. It meant they were up against someone who knew how to evade detection. Despite this, Postiglione knew that even the most careful killers make mistakes. He and his team committed to analyzing every inch of the crime scene, however meticulously cleaned it appeared, and would follow every lead, no matter how small. The question haunting the detectives was simple but terrifying. How many more victims would there be before they could stop this predator? The sense of urgency grew as they quickly realized this killer was just getting started. As the investigation pressed forward, the autopsies of Steve Hampton and Sarah Jackson provided further insight into the brutality of the crime. Both victims had been shot multiple times in the head at close range, a method used by killers to ensure that there were no survivors. This execution-style killing left no room for doubt this was a targeted, cold-blooded act meant to eliminate witnesses and leave no one behind to describe the attacker. The medical examiner confirmed what detectives feared. This was not the work of an amateur. The precision with which the shots had been delivered indicated someone who was not only familiar with firearms, but also comfortable with violence. Each shot was deliberate and final, leaving both victims with no chance of survival. A key piece of evidence recovered from the bodies was .32 caliber bullets carefully extracted from the victims during the autopsy. These bullets were sent to the ballistics lab, where forensic experts began working to determine whether they could be matched to other crimes. At the time, this caliber of bullet was not as common as larger rounds, and its use could help narrow down potential suspects. The detectives hoped that matching the ballistics would provide a crucial link either to previous unsolved crimes or to a potential weapon in the killer's possession. The recovery of the .32 caliber slugs was the first tangible piece of evidence that could be used to track the killer's movements and potentially connect this horrific crime to others. While the killer may have left the crime scene nearly spotless, the bullets told a story of their own, a story that Detective Postiglione and his team would follow relentlessly. News of the brutal murders at Captain D's seafood restaurant spread like wildfire throughout Nashville, a city that prided itself on its vibrant community and welcoming atmosphere was now gripped by fear and uncertainty. This wasn't just a robbery gone wrong, this was a targeted killing in a place that was supposed to be safe, a place where families dined and teenagers worked part-time jobs. The cold, execution-style killings sent a shockwave through the local population. Local media outlets quickly picked up the story, painting a chilling picture of what had occurred. Headlines ran stories about the murder of Steve Hampton and Sarah Jackson, describing in detail the methodical nature of their deaths. As the news spread, the fear was palpable. Parents who had once been comfortable with their children working late shifts in restaurants now questioned whether it was safe. Restaurants, which were typically bustling with life, suddenly felt like targets. Employees looked over their shoulders and business owners wondered if their establishment could be next. Interviews with locals captured the growing unease. Neighbors who lived near the restaurant expressed shock that something so horrific could happen so close to home. One local resident shared, It's terrifying to think that people you see every day, people working hard, could be taken like that. It feels like we're not safe anywhere anymore. The city, known for its lively music and southern charm, was now clouded with fear. The media coverage only heightened the anxiety. Each news report, each update on the investigation reminded the public that a killer was on the loose, someone who hadn't hesitated to take lives. With no suspect in custody and few leads, the entire community felt as though they were waiting for the next strike. For Nashville, this was more than just a crime. It was the shattering of a sense of security that had long defined the city's character. 
As detectives in Nashville worked to piece together the clues from the restaurant murders, the investigation eventually led them to a man with a deeply troubled past, Paul Dennis Reed. To the casual observer, Reed might have appeared as just another man chasing a dream in Music City, but behind his aspiration to become a country music star was a life marred by violence, crime, and delusion. Born in Texas, Reed moved to Nashville with hopes of making it big as a country singer. Like many before him, he sought fame on the city's storied stages, but success never came. He performed at small venues, often telling those around him that he was destined for stardom. But behind the facade of a struggling artist was a man unraveling. Reed's failed music career, combined with mounting frustration, began to give way to a darker side. Before arriving in Nashville, Reed already had a criminal history. He had served time in Texas for aggravated armed robbery, a crime that had nearly turned fatal. In the late 1980s, Reed was sentenced to 20 years in prison for a string of seven armed robberies in Houston. He had held up various fast food restaurants at gunpoint, displaying a pattern of behavior that would later become chillingly familiar in Nashville. His violent tendencies and disregard for life were already evident during these earlier crimes. However, Reed was paroled after serving only six years of his sentence, and by the time he made his way to Nashville, he appeared outwardly like a man trying to rebuild his life. But his inner demons were never far from the surface. His inability to control his anger and his growing sense of failure in the music industry seemed to fuel the same violent impulses that had landed him in prison years earlier. Reed's dreams of becoming a country star were, by then, shattered. He took jobs in various fast food restaurants to make ends meet, but those who worked with him often described him as erratic and prone to bursts of aggression. His paranoid behavior, combined with his growing resentment toward the world, made him a ticking time bomb. As police would soon discover, the man who once aspired to sing on stage was capable of committing the kind of atrocities that would forever mark Nashville's history. On March 23, 1997, just over a month after the horrific killings at Captain D's, another violent attack rocked Nashville. This time, the target was a McDonald's in a nearby suburb. In what was becoming a terrifying pattern, the quiet routine of fast food employees was shattered by another brutal assault. In the early morning hours, two employees, Andrea Brown, a 17-year-old high school student, and Ronald Santiago, a 27-year-old crew member, were found executed in a manner eerily similar to the Captain D's murders. Both victims had been shot in the head at close range, their lives taken in an instant, leaving no chance for resistance or escape. The modus operandi mirrored the first attack. The killer entered the restaurant just before it was set to open, took control of the situation, and methodically forced the victims to the back of the building. There, as with the previous murders, the killer ensured no witnesses would survive, delivering execution-style shots with chilling precision. The cash register and safe were emptied, though the primary objective seemed far more sinister than robbery alone. It was the systematic elimination of witnesses that struck fear into the hearts of investigators and the public alike. As detectives processed the crime scene, they were once again struck by the professional nature of the killings. The restaurant, like Captain D's, was left clean and organized, with little to no sign of a struggle. The perpetrator had clearly calculated every move, leaving minimal physical evidence behind. For investigators, it was undeniable. The same killer was responsible for both sets of murders. This second attack sent waves of panic through the Nashville community. Two violent, cold-blooded attacks within a matter of weeks suggested that a serial killer was on the loose, targeting fast food workers in particular. Fear began to spread even further restaurant employees, particularly those working late or early shifts, felt vulnerable and exposed. No one could predict where the killer would strike next, and police were left racing against time to catch a man who seemed to kill without hesitation. 
For Detective Postigliani and his team, the pressure mounted. The similarities between the two incidents were undeniable, and they knew that if they didn't catch the killer soon, it was only a matter of time before he would strike again. In a terrifying twist of fate, Jose Gonzalez, an employee at McDonald's, became the first person to survive an encounter with the killer. On the night of the March 23, 1997 attack, Gonzalez's narrow escape would eventually prove to be a turning point in the investigation. His courage and quick thinking would offer investigators the first critical glimpse into the identity of the predator stalking Nashville's fast food workers. During the robbery, the killer forced Jose Gonzalez, along with his co-workers Andrea Brown and Ronald Santiago, into the back of the McDonald's. Once there, the killer's actions followed the same deadly pattern as before. He ordered them to lie face down on the floor, execution style, and began systematically shooting his victims. As he approached Gonzalez, however, his gun jammed, and in a moment of desperation, the killer turned to his knife. Gonzalez was stabbed 17 times in the back, neck, and head, each blow intended to finish him off. But in a move of sheer survival instinct, he managed to play dead, remaining motionless as the killer continued his rampage. Barely clinging to life, Gonzalez waited until the killer left before dragging himself to the phone to dial 911. His call, though brief and cut off before he could give details, alerted the authorities to the horrific scene unfolding inside the restaurant. Paramedics rushed Gonzalez to the hospital, where he miraculously survived his life-threatening injuries. Though severely wounded, he became the first eyewitness to recount the events of that fateful night and, more importantly, to provide the police with a crucial lead in the case. In the days following the attack, Gonzalez worked with detectives to create a composite sketch of the killer, describing him as a muscular white male in his 30s, a piece of the puzzle investigators desperately needed. Gonzalez's testimony was a breakthrough in an otherwise stalled investigation. For the first time, detectives had a clear description of the suspect. His bravery not only saved his own life, but also brought law enforcement closer to identifying the man responsible for the string of brutal killings that had terrorized the city. As detectives delved deeper into the investigations of both the Captain D's and McDonald's murders, it became increasingly clear that they were dealing with a serial killer. The parallels between the two incidents were too strong to ignore, and they began to formally connect the dots between the crimes. Both scenes showed chilling similarities in the way the murders were executed, the targeting of restaurant employees, and the methodical nature of the robberies. In both attacks, the modus operandi was consistent. The killer would enter the restaurant just before or after business hours, when few employees were present, ensuring minimal witnesses. He would then round up the workers, lead them to the back of the restaurant, and execute them with cold precision, aiming to leave no survivors. Each time, he would rob the establishment, taking cash from the safe and registers, but the brutal execution of witnesses suggested that this was more than just a robbery, it was a calculated killing spree. Detectives found that the Captain D's murders of Steve Hampton and Sarah Jackson bore striking similarities to the McDonald's attack where Andrea Brown and Ronald Santiago were killed. In both cases, the victims were shot in the head at close range, execution style, with no sign of a struggle. The crime scenes were unnervingly clean, with little physical evidence left behind, leading investigators to believe they were dealing with a professional, someone who knew how to cover their tracks and avoid detection. What also stood out to detectives was the fact that the targeting of fast food workers seemed intentional. These establishments were easy targets often understaffed during off hours and holding significant amounts of cash. The killer's preference for striking at these vulnerable locations was clear, and detectives feared it was only a matter of time before he struck again. The survivor, Jose Gonzalez, had provided a crucial breakthrough, offering a composite sketch and a description that further helped investigators. As they began piecing together evidence, detectives could now confidently state that the same person was behind these brutal murders. 
It was a turning point in the case, but the question that loomed large over the investigation was whether they could catch him before more lives were lost. With the city on edge, the police knew they had to act quickly. They increased patrols around similar businesses, and investigators worked tirelessly to find any additional leads that could stop the killer from striking again. As detectives combed through the evidence in their quest to link the Captain D's and McDonald's murders, one of the most significant breakthroughs came from forensic analysis. While the killer had been meticulous in his execution of the crimes, leaving little physical evidence behind, the investigation turned up two crucial pieces, shoe prints at the Captain D's crime scene and a fingerprint on Steve Hampton's rental card. At the scene of the Captain D's murders, investigators had found a shoe print underneath a trash bag. This might have seemed minor at first, but it soon became clear that this shoe print didn't belong to any of the employees or victims. Given that the crime scene had been cleaned and prepared for the restaurant's opening, this single shoe print became a valuable clue, suggesting it was left by the killer before or during the attack. Simultaneously, as investigators traced the belongings of Steve Hampton, they came across his rental card thrown along Ellington Parkway, miles from the crime scene. While most of the items recovered didn't yield much evidence, this card proved to be the key. A partial thumbprint was found on the card, and this print didn't match Hampton or any of his family members. This was the break detectives had been hoping for a foreign print likely left by the killer. The forensic teams analyzed the print and began to run it through databases, hoping for a match. Though initially the identity of the killer remained elusive, this partial print gave detectives the first real physical evidence to work with. It was now clear that the killer had made a crucial mistake, he had left behind something traceable. Together, the shoe print and fingerprint helped to establish a forensic trail, connecting the crimes in a way that solidified investigators' theory that they were dealing with the same individual. These two pieces of evidence were critical in narrowing the search and would later play an instrumental role in tying Paul Dennis Reed to the murders. As the investigation continued, forensic evidence became the backbone of the case, slowly unraveling the identity of the man responsible for the string of killings. Just a month after the horrific attack at McDonald's, Paul Dennis Reed struck again, this time targeting a Baskin Robbins in Clarksville, Tennessee, a suburb of Nashville. On April 23, 1997, two young women, Michelle Mace, age 16, and Angela Holmes, age 21, were abducted from the ice cream shop where they worked. This third incident marked an escalation in brutality, sending shockwaves through the already terrified community. The abduction of Michelle and Angela was discovered when the Baskin Robbins was found empty after hours with the register and safe cleared out. Initially, there were no signs of the women's whereabouts. Investigators feared the worst, especially as the pattern of restaurant worker killings had already been established. Their fears were confirmed the following day when a man walking his dog in Dunbar Cave State Park, located roughly three miles from the Baskin Robbins, stumbled upon a horrific scene. In the remote woods of the state park, Michelle Mace and Angela Holmes were found murdered, their bodies having been brutally discarded. Unlike the previous murders, where the victims had been shot execution style, Reed's violence had taken a more savage turn. The women's throats had been slashed, a gruesome act that indicated an escalation in his willingness to inflict suffering. The brutality of the murders left detectives and forensic teams stunned. The killer was growing more dangerous with each passing attack. The bodies of Michelle and Angela were left in a wooded area of the park, tied up with aprons from their workplace. The nature of their deaths suggested Reed's growing comfort with violence, and it signaled a new level of cruelty. It became clear to investigators that he was not just focused on robbery, he seemed to relish in the power of taking lives. For Nashville and surrounding areas, this incident deepened the sense of terror. The killer, now linked to three violent attacks on restaurant workers, was proving to be unpredictable and growing bolder with each crime. 
As the investigation continued, the pressure on law enforcement intensified. They had to stop Paul Reed before he could strike again. This third attack showed a marked increase in the level of brutality and recklessness, and the community knew that with each day, the killer was only getting more dangerous. For detectives, the evidence was beginning to mount, and they were closing in on a man who had left a trail of bloodshed and fear across Tennessee. As the murders in Nashville and Clarksville mounted and the sense of panic spread throughout the region, law enforcement agencies realized they were facing an increasingly dangerous serial killer. The complexity of the investigation involving multiple jurisdictions and an escalating body count led to the formation of a dedicated task force. This task force was a multi-agency collaboration involving local police, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation TBI, and federal authorities. The goal of the task force was to pool resources, expertise, and information to track down the killer, now identified as a high-priority threat to public safety. Detectives from Nashville Metro Police worked hand-in-hand -hand with their counterparts in Clarksville, coordinating efforts to follow up on every lead and ensure no detail was overlooked. Investigators connected the dots between the crimes, noting the clear similarities in the methodical execution of fast food workers and the clean crime scenes that left behind minimal physical evidence. As the task force got to work, they recognized the critical importance of media outreach in gathering information from the public. With a growing number of victims and little information on the suspect, investigators took to the airwaves and newspapers, issuing public warnings and calling for any possible leads. They released the composite sketch based on survivor Jose Gonzalez's description of the killer and provided details of the suspect's modus operandi. The warnings spread through television broadcasts, radio, and local newspapers, urging fast food workers and managers to be on high alert and to report any suspicious behavior immediately. The task force also set up a special hotline and an email tip line, encouraging the public to come forward with any potential sightings of the suspect or unusual activity near fast food restaurants. As the case gained national attention, the hope was that increased visibility would lead to a break in the investigation. The task force's focus was not only on identifying and capturing the killer, but also on preventing another attack. Patrols around fast food establishments were increased, and local law enforcement began visiting restaurants to offer security advice and provide reassurance to terrified employees. The killer had already struck three times, and there was no doubt in the minds of investigators that he would strike again if he wasn't stopped soon. Despite the overwhelming Overwhelming pressure, the task force remained committed to tracking down the killer, piecing together forensic evidence and leads, all while ensuring the public remained informed and vigilant. With time running out, the task force knew that the next move by Paul Dennis Reed could come at any moment, and they were determined to stop him before more lives were lost. As the task force intensified their investigation into the restaurant murders, one of the most critical leads came from witness reports near the Baskin Robbins crime scene. Several individuals had noticed a suspicious red car in the vicinity of the ice cream shop on the night of Michelle Mace and Angela Holmes's abduction and subsequent murder. This detail quickly became a focal point for investigators who were grasping for any solid clues that could lead them to the elusive killer. The witnesses described seeing a small red vehicle parked near the Baskin Robbins just before closing time on April 23, 1997, the night of the murders. In addition, another witness claimed to have spotted a similar red car at Dunbar Cave State Park, the remote location where the victims' bodies were later discovered. These sightings suggested that the car might have been used by the killer to transport his victims from the store to the park, adding a new layer of insight into his movements and logistics. Given the consistent sightings of the red car near both the crime scene and dump site, the task force began urgently canvassing the area and reaching out to the public for more information. They released details of the car's appearance through media outlets, asking anyone who had seen a vehicle matching the description to come forward. 
For detectives, this was a crucial lead not only did it help confirm the killer's possible method of transport, but it also gave them something tangible to look for. Investigators expanded their search, trying to track down red cars that matched the witnesses' descriptions in the surrounding areas. Although this lead did not immediately provide an identity for the killer, it narrowed their focus and added momentum to the investigation. With each new detail, they were getting closer to connecting all the pieces of the puzzle. The red car would eventually play a pivotal role as more witnesses came forward, helping to solidify the link between Paul Bennis Reed and the murders and setting the stage for his eventual capture. The investigation was now homing in on its target, with law enforcement carefully piecing together Reed's movements and building a case that would finally stop his spree of terror. The case took a significant turn when detectives finally identified Paul Dennis Reed as a prime suspect in the restaurant murders. The combination of witness statements, forensic evidence, and Reed's criminal background all converged to reveal him as the elusive killer. Paul Dennis Reed was first brought to investigators' attention through a mix of eyewitness accounts and forensic connections. The red car spotted near both the Baskin Robbins crime scene and Dunbar Cave State Park became a focal point for detectives. Witnesses had described seeing Reed's vehicle near the locations of the murders, which raised suspicions. In addition to the car, forensic evidence also began to paint a clearer picture. Detectives had recovered a fingerprint from Steve Hampton's rental card, which eventually matched Reed's prints. This discovery was a turning point as it directly linked Reed to the crime scene of the Captain D's murders. As investigators worked to piece together more about Reed's life, his criminal history came to the forefront. Reed had previously been convicted of armed robbery and had served time in prison, giving detectives a more complete profile of the man they were now hunting. Another key factor in Reed's identification came from the eyewitness testimony of Jose Gonzalez, the sole survivor of the McDonald's attack. Gonzalez had provided a detailed composite sketch of the man who had attacked him and killed his co-workers. As detectives compared the sketch with Reed's appearance and dug deeper into his background, they realized they were zeroing in on their suspect. Reed's behavior after the murders also helped connect him to the crimes. He had a history of working in fast food restaurants, which placed him in environments similar to those he targeted. His previous employment and erratic behavior, including an incident where he had threatened his former manager at gunpoint, made him an even more likely suspect. Finally, as detectives gathered more evidence, including shoe prints and fiber analysis linking him to the scenes, they had enough to make their move. The combination of physical evidence, witness reports, and Reed's criminal record was more than enough to tie him to the series of brutal murders that had shaken Nashville. With Reed identified, the authorities were now poised to bring him to justice, but there was still a long road ahead as they prepared to apprehend the man responsible for so much fear and death. In June of 1997, Paul Dennis Reed was finally arrested, marking a major victory for the task force that had been tirelessly working to bring the restaurant's serial killer to justice. Reed's arrest came after a strange and confrontational encounter with his former employer, Mitch Roberts, the manager of a restaurant where Reed had previously worked. This confrontation, combined with Reed's growing erratic behavior, ultimately led to his capture by law enforcement. On the night of the arrest, Reed approached Mitch Roberts at his home, claiming he had information about an employee who had been stealing from the restaurant. Roberts, who had fired Reed several months earlier for aggressive behavior, was immediately suspicious. What struck Roberts most was the sight of Reed's red car, a vehicle that matched the description given by witnesses near the scene of the Baskin Robbins murders. While Reed attempted to regain his former job, Roberts's wife sensed something was off and urged her husband to get rid of him. 
As the conversation continued, Reed's behavior escalated. He pulled a gun on Roberts and threatened to kill him. Roberts, thinking quickly, pretended to have a weapon inside his house and called for his wife to bring it. This bluff caused Reed to retreat, but the incident left no doubt that Reed was dangerous. After fleeing the scene, Roberts immediately called the police, informing them of the situation and his suspicion that Reed might be the man responsible for the restaurant killings. Local authorities acted swiftly, setting up a trap. When Reed called Roberts later that night to apologize and clear things up, police encouraged Roberts to lure him back to the house. When Reed returned, he was met by law enforcement and was promptly arrested without incident. The arrest of Paul Dennis Reed was a pivotal moment in the investigation, and his red car, the same one spotted near multiple crime scenes, solidified the task force's belief that they had captured the man responsible for the brutal murders. As investigators delved into Reed's background, his erratic behavior, long criminal history, and connection to the fast food industry all pointed to him as the restaurant killer who had terrorized Nashville and Clarksville for months. With Reed in custody, authorities now had the daunting task of building a case against him, but the evidence from eyewitnesses to forensic links was already starting to paint a clear picture of his guilt. After Paul Dennis Reed's arrest in June 1997, his defense team quickly mounted a strategy to avoid the death penalty by claiming that Reed was mentally unfit to stand trial. They argued that he suffered from severe mental illness and lacked the capacity to understand the nature of his crimes. This led to a series of psychological evaluations aimed at determining whether Reed was legally insane at the time of the murders. Reed's defense team asserted that his behavior, including bizarre claims about being under government surveillance and the subject of mind control experiments, indicated a deteriorated mental state. These erratic claims, along with his violent outbursts and previous criminal history, were used to support the defense's argument for insanity. However, the prosecution pushed back, arguing that Reed was fully aware of his actions and that his pattern of calculated murders targeting fast food restaurant workers demonstrated a clear and deliberate intent. They pointed out that Reed had methodically eliminated witnesses and left behind minimal evidence at each crime scene, which contradicted the idea that his actions were driven by uncontrollable mental illness. During the court proceedings, multiple psychologists and experts were brought in to evaluate Reed. After thorough testing and review of his mental health history, the court ultimately concluded that while Reed may have exhibited abnormal behavior, he was mentally competent to stand trial. The psychological evaluations determined that Reed understood the difference between right and wrong and was fully aware of the consequences of his actions. His history of planning and executing the murders with precision further supported this conclusion. The court's decision was pivotal as it cleared the way for Reed to be tried for the seven murders he was accused of committing. The rejection of the insanity plea meant that Reed would face the full weight of the law, including the possibility of the death penalty for his cold-blooded killing spree. This decision added another layer of complexity to the trial as the defense was left with fewer options to protect Reed from the harshest of punishments, while the prosecution pressed forward with their case, confident in Reed's mental fitness for trial. In September 1999, the long-awaited trial of Paul Dennis Reed began. The prosecution was armed with a wealth of evidence gathered over the course of the multi-agency investigation. Leading the case were Assistant District Attorney General Tom Henderson and other key prosecutors who were determined to hold Reed accountable for the seven brutal murders he had committed. The courtroom was packed with the families of the victims and the media watching closely as the legal proceedings got underway. 
The prosecution's case was built on solid forensic evidence and witness testimonies that painted Reed as the cold, calculated killer behind the string of restaurant murders. Key elements of the prosecution's argument included the discovery of Reed's fingerprints on a card belonging to one of the victims, shoe prints matching those found at the crime scenes, and perhaps most damning, traces of blood from the victims on Reed's shoes. Additionally, the prosecution brought forward Jose Jose Gonzalez, the sole survivor of the McDonald's attack, who identified Reed as his attacker. The prosecution laid out a clear timeline linking Reed to each of the murders with both physical and circumstantial evidence. Their aim was to show the jury that Reed's actions were premeditated, methodical, and deliberate, leaving no room for doubt that he was fully aware of his crimes and their consequences. Reed's defense team, however, attempted to dismantle the prosecution's case by asserting that much of the evidence presented was circumstantial. They argued that there was no direct proof placing Reed at the scene of each crime at the time of the murders and that the forensic evidence was inconclusive. One of their key strategies was to discredit the witness testimonies, particularly that of Jose Gonzalez, by claiming inconsistencies in his story and suggesting that he could have been mistaken in identifying Reed. The defense also pointed out that there was no DNA evidence directly linking Reed to the crime scenes, and they highlighted gaps in the forensic timeline to cast doubt on the prosecution's argument. Despite their efforts, the defense struggled to counter the over overwhelming amount of circumstantial evidence. Reed's past criminal behavior, particularly his previous convictions for armed robbery and violent tendencies, further eroded the defense's credibility in the eyes of the jury. After weeks of emotional testimonies, forensic analyses, and legal arguments, the jury reached a verdict. In September 1999, Paul Dennis Reed was found guilty of seven counts of first-degree murder. His crimes included the killings at Captain D's, McDonald's, and Baskin Robbins, which had terrorized the communities of Nashville and Clarksville in early 1997. The sentencing phase was swift and decisive. Given the brutality of the crimes and the number of victims, Reed was sentenced to death, receiving seven death sentences, one for each life he had taken. The courtroom was heavy with emotion as the victims' families expressed both relief and sorrow at the conclusion of the case. Reed, who had maintained his innocence throughout the trial, showed little reaction as the sentence was delivered. The aftermath of Paul Dennis Reed's killing spree left a lasting scar on the communities of Nashville and Clarksville. The brutal and senseless nature of the murders shook the region and many families struggled to recover from the trauma. However, the work of law enforcement in capturing and prosecuting Reed provided some measure of closure to those affected. The case became a landmark for Nashville law enforcement, highlighting the importance of forensic science, interagency cooperation, and the relentless pursuit of justice. The task force, which had worked tirelessly to bring Reed to justice, was widely praised for its diligence and effectiveness. The case also underscored the critical role of witness testimonies and how small details, such as the sighting of a red car, could break open a complex investigation. In reflecting on the legacy of the case, it is clear that the dedication of the detectives and prosecutors in seeking justice for the victims played a pivotal role in bringing an end to the terror Reed had inflicted. The case continues to be remembered as a defining moment in the history of Tennessee law enforcement, demonstrating the power of teamwork, resilience, and forensic expertise in solving even the most harrowing cases. The story of Paul Dennis Reed is a somber reminder of the darkness that can lurk in society, but it is also a testament to the strength of the community and the determination of those who fight for justice.